Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Equal Justice Works Fellowship webinar on last minute insider tips for crafting a competitive fellowship proposal. Um, my name is Lila Stellick Berry, and I'm the senior program manager for the fellowships team at Equal Justice Works. Um, I'm joined today um, by my colleague, um, Nico Rodovich, who is the program coordinator for the fellowships team and is um, going to be dropping some useful links in the chat. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will be answering questions at the end. Um, using the Q&A function. If there is an issue with the um, Q&A function, you can feel free to drop it in the chat to me. Um, and I have enabled closed captions. Um, please uh, let Nico know if you're having, or me know if you're having any difficulty with the closed captions. I believe everyone should also be able to do, um, to enable, them on their side. Um, and with that, I will get started. So we are going to actually kick it off with a poll here for you all. The question is, who is joining us today on this webinar? And the question is, uh, the responses could be, I am a um, 3L2L, 1L. I'm sorry, I realized I forgot to <laughs> include recent law school grad as a choice. Um, I am a staff member at a potential host organization. I'm a law school pro professional, or I am, I'm in none of the above categories. So I will give you all a little bit longer, and then please feel free to um, answer, and I will close the poll now that 100% of folks have answered. Okay, ending poll. So it looks like, um, oh my goodness, 74% of you all are three L's. Awesome. This just helps me know perhaps where to um, dig in a little bit more and spend a little bit more time on in the presentation. And then I would love to know in this poll, how far along are you in your application, please? So the answers are I'm zero to 25% through completing it, somewhere like 26 to 50% through completing it, 51 to 75% through, uh, almost done, 76 to 100% through, and then not applying this year myself, perhaps, you know, for a law school professional there or for a, um, um, for the um, host organization staff. All right, I'm going to end the poll. And it looks like most folks are, about half of you all are about a quarter of the way in and then the next most common response was somewhere between a quarter and a half of the way in. Um, I'm just going to share as well that if the Q&A function or the chat isn't working for you, um, we can use the raise hand function um, and I can answer those questions at the end. Um, and then we can also have um, questions answered via our email, which is fellowships at equaljusticeworks.org. I will quickly drop that in the chat. So a little bit about Equal Justice Works, and I will just keep this really quick and really top level, is that um, the mission of EJW is to create opportunities for lawyers to transform their passion for equal justice into a lifelong commitment to public service. So we help folks launch their public interest careers um, by offering postgraduate fellowships, um, 
including the Design Your Own Fellowship, which is the focus of today's webinar, but also cohort or group fellowships. Um, and there's more information about those cohort fellowships on our website, www.equaljusticeworks.org. Um, we also um, have colleagues uh, who encourage and work with law schools to expand their offerings of public interest law programming, and then to render a career in public interest law more sustainable, Equal Justice Works advocate advocates for debt relief, specifically student loan debt relief for public interest lawyers. And Equal Justice Works also offers summer programs for law students. So today, Equal Justice Works hosts the largest postgraduate legal fellowship program in the U.S. There are more than 200 fellows currently working at nonprofit host organizations across the country in a very wide variety of fields. Um, as mentioned a minute ago, um, Equal Justice Works also puts together summer programs for law students and offers on the website student debt resources. And we have a network of over about 190 member law schools. There are, are over 2,400 fellowship alumni, 85% of whom remain in public service. So just to go through a little bit, the design your own fellowship overview and eligibility criteria, I will say I will go through these quickly to get into the tips of crafting a competitive fellowship application. If you would like more information on the overview and eligibility, I highly recommend you visit um, the website and check out the applicant guide. Nico will drop the link in the chat. Um, and also please check out the webinar recording on the Equal Justice Works YouTube page of the how to apply and tips to succeed webinar. We have a version that is bilingual, Spanish, English, and one that is in English. So there are four components to a design your own fellowship. These are two year projects, 24 month long projects that for the class of 2024 run from September, 2024, to September 2026. Uh, the components are the project, the candidate, the host organization, and the sponsor. So the project is a project that serves an underserved population or community and or addresses an unmet or under addressed legal need. Projects should be innovative and discreet, tailored, and be designed to have a lasting impact. That is, they should have a sustainability component. Fellows work and achieve their projects in a variety of ways. Often projects combine strategies. So they can include strategies like impact litigation, direct representation, awareness raising or know your rights trainings, public outreach, community outreach, coalition or network building, um, or a combination thereof. Projects that focus on standard criminal defense or international law or are ineligible. So immigration focused projects are eligible to be design your own fellowship projects. However, they must deal with like the US legal system and US immigration law. If you have a very specific question about a really <laughs> specific kind of project you would like to implement, please do email us with all those juicy details at fellowshipsequaljusticeworks.org and we can um, let you know kind of if this uh, idea that you're proposing is eligible or not. Please note that we do not review portions of the application. We don't have the bandwidth to do so, and we also really want to be kind of fair to everyone and ensure that this is a, a process um, where um, no one is is kind of put at, at some kind of advantage. So we aren't going to be able to review any any portions of applications or weigh in on like the content of the application, but we can kind of say whether something is eligible or ineligible per the rules and regs of the, the fellowship requirements. On to the tips for the application. Please 
highlight in the application how what you want to do in your project. I'm speaking to you as applicants. Um, apologies for other folks on the call. Um, but if you're helping an applicant, uh, this is also applicable. Please dive into how what you're proposing to do in your project is distinctive from and different from what a staff attorney does at your host organization. Um, think about those sustainability, durability components. Think about how your project is innovative. For example, you could pilot a new tool, a new tool. You could pilot a new kind of technology. Um, you could expand the work of the host organization to work in a certain geographical region or with a certain population. Um, that's a little bit innovative. If you, uh, if you coupled that with the use of a new app, the use of a new database, if uh, that might make it more innovative and also more sustainable because the app and the database would outlast your fellowship. Um, are there materials or resources you can create that will outlive the two year project duration? Is there a pool of people you can train or equip to continue doing a certain kind of work to address an unmet legal need for an underserved population. That's an example of an innovative approach that has uh, a sustainability component. Um, also highlight in the application what makes the goals of your project ambitious but feasible. Given the context in which your project will occur, which is a little, it takes a little bit of forecasting because this project will start in September, 2024 and conclude in September, 2026. So in that climate, in that context, what makes it realistic that you can accomplish what you set out as your project goals? And also why is this something of note? Um, I would say that one of the <laughs> ways to answer those tricky questions is to not go it alone, an applicant and a host org staff person or multiple people at the host organization and should really be collaborating and discussing in order to complete the application. The host organization has worked in this field for a while and knows the context and the landscape. They know perhaps what they're planning to do starting in September, 2024 and what it looks like in 2025, 2026. So that can be really helpful information to have as you're setting out your, your project goals and the other parts of your application. So the second component of the fellowship is you, the applicant. Once you submit your application, you become a candidate <laughs> if you're eligible. So to be eligible for uh, the class of 2024 fellowships, again, those start in 2024, you must be a graduate of an EJW member law school by September 2024 with a JD or LLM. Um, um, linked to in the application is the list of EJW member law schools that's on our website. Fellows commit to taking the bar before their fellowship begins, which is usually in July, but does vary a little bit by state slash territory. One must not have held a full-time permanent public interest attorney position. There's more detail on this in the applicant guide, so please do check it out if you think that might rule you out from being eligible. And one must not have participated in a major fellowship program like Skadden, Echoing Green, Justice Catalyst, Soros Justice, or Immigrant Justice Corps Fellowship. However, if you have been an AmeriCorps Legal Fellow or held a Gap or Bridge Fellowship, um, you are still eligible. If you have held a clerkship, you are still eligible. If you have a question about if your fellowship was a Gap slash Bridge one, um, those are often offered by like law schools. Um, please write us, fellowshipsequaljusticeworks.org. We do not ask for your transcript or GPA or a class rank. Um, we're really interested much more in the fit and alignment of the, 
the applicant's skill set and background with the work of the host organization and with the subject matter area and geographical region of the project. A tip to highlight in the application, your personal connection to this project, to this population or community, to this neighborhood or city, um, to this issue area. You can draw on your lived experience, the experience of your family, um, things that you've studied, uh, things that you've observed during your work, during your uh, time in law school, during your internship, um, and, and really be clear about your commitment to public interests and the issue area of your project, as well as the population slash community and geographical zone where your project will occur. The third component is the host organization. Um, Nico, do you mind please putting in the chat the link to the host organization guide? Thank you, thank you. Um, even if you're an applicant and you're not working at a nonprofit that might host a fellow, it can just be helpful to skim the host organization guide, I think. Um, it's obviously addressed to a different audience than the applicant guide. Um, it doesn't really contain anything that like you must know. That would be in the applicant guide, but I do think it just kind of gives a little bit more context um, and can maybe kind of be helpful for you as the applicant as you're meeting with folks at the host organization. They might ask you questions and you can kind of point them to the, the host organization guide or just kind of have that information ready because you are familiar with what's in the host org guide. So to be eligible to host a fellow, um, organization must be a nonprofit organization registered in the U.S. or territories with legal staff. There has to be at least one attorney on staff to supervise slash advise the fellow who, as we noted earlier, is new to public interest law. The host organization must be capable of providing to the fellow benefits, health insurance, and office space or comparable benefits for remote work. Equal Justice Works Design Your Own Fellowships are open to fellows who are applying to work totally remotely, totally in person, or in a hybrid manner. Um, please just outline that clearly in the application. It's pretty broken out into specific questions in the application. So um, there's opportunities to explain if it's a hybrid setup, what you're envisioning. The host organization must have the bandwidth to support and supervise new attorneys. So there is something at the very, very end of the fellowship application, which is the certification form. It is a a Word document that you would download from the platform. The platform for the class of 2024 application is called Submittable. So you'll download it from Submittable, um, share it with your host organization, review it together, and re-upload it and save it to your application once it's been completed. That form is to be signed by someone from the host organization who has signatory authority as which is up to that organization, as well as applicant, and you're verifying salary, you're verifying benefits. Um, essentially, the fellow is to be treated as any other employee of the host organization. All Equal Justice Works Design Your Own Fellows are, are employees of their host organization, and so the salary is and the benefits uh, is that is all set by the host organization in line with like their employment practices. Um, and so it's ideal to have those conversations ASAP about things like workplace culture, working hours, the setup, um, insurance, et cetera. But on that certification form, Equal Justice Works does require that host organizations are providing this to fellows. So uh, onto the tips to highlight in your application. At the end, towards the end of the application, there is a pretty robust section that you will need to complete um, with your host organization point of contact. Um, and we really encourage it to be detailed. So there's a section asking about the super, the fellows, future supervisors experience in the area of the project on which the fellow is working. Does this person have expertise in this issue area? Um, I've seen applications where it was a little vague, where it did say like, the supervisor has several years of experience working on immigration law, for example. Well, what 
is several and then what subset of immigration law like if there are certain visas or certain specific issue area expertises that the supervisor has that is important to chronicle at that point in application um also again a big part of a competitive successful application is being really clear about fit and alignment so how does this project that's being proposed align with the organization's strategic vision and mission and the work that they currently do is really important to detail one way to demonstrate fit between the applicant and the host organization is if they've had a prior relationship. For example, um, this person was a former intern. Um, it's not necessary that one has a, uh, that prior relationship in order to become a fellow at the host org. Um, for example, it's certainly very common and like certainly like legitimate and very valid if one says I was really interested in the work that this organization was doing in my hometown of X. Um, I emailed them in June when I learned about the EJW Design Your Own Fellowship Program and we started having Zoom calls to craft this application together. That's great. Um, I fit this, you know, I fit this organization as applicant because I have XYZ skills. I'm from this city. Um, I've worked with this uh, population before, uh, I'm from this community, et cetera. Um, this project aligns with the work of the host that the host organization is doing in X area, working on ABC. And we'll give some specific um, examples later. And then the fourth component of the project is the sponsor. The sponsor is the financial supporter of the fellowship project. Um, as an applicant or as a host organization, you do not need to worry about securing a sponsor. Equal Justice Works um, secures sponsors for fellows. Um, and sponsors can be all kinds of... Um, there's all kinds of types of sponsors. So it might be a law firm, a business or corporation, a foundation, a bar association, or an individual. Sponsors are engaged in the interview and selection process for the fellow that they're going to sponsor and remain engaged throughout two, the two years of the fellowship project. They can provide material support um, and like training, for example, to the fellow um, as well as financial export, support. Um, some sponsors do express a preference to fund projects in a certain subject matter or issue area or in a certain geography. So, um, on the landing page for the application website, which Nico can drop in the chat, um, again, there is a list of sponsor preferences. It reflects the most up-to-date information EJW has on what sponsors want to fund, but there are many, many sponsors that fund nationwide slash anywhere, and they do not have a predetermined preference. They are looking for strong projects in any kind of area or in any place. Um, also sponsors come in as the months pass. So as time goes by, there will be more and more sponsors. Um, so we really encourage you to put forward your strongest possible application and not worry if you don't see that reflected on the sponsor priority sheet. Um, again, that's just a snapshot in time, what we know now. And there's a lot of uh, sponsors that have like no predetermined preferences. It might more it might be more useful to view that list as like food for thought, especially if you're torn between like a couple um, issue areas, a couple cities, for example. And if you see like one issue area in one city listed there and not the other one, maybe, maybe it could be something you'd like to consider. But really um, putting forward where the applicant and the host organization align with the population and issue at hand in the project. That is, I think that is the key really to uh, 
a really strong application. So please don't be deterred if you don't see it listed there. So some benefits of being a DYO fellow is that fellows get to gain firsthand experience working in their chosen issue area. They get to kind of create their dream job working on a special project with other export experts on the project in the host organization where they want to work. Um, host organizations benefit from getting this um, staff member on board who's a specialist in the area of their project. Fellows also have um, learning and networking opportunities with other fellows and alumni. Um, these are usually on a monthly basis. Um, often they're virtual. Occasionally they are in person as well. Um, so the salaries are set by the host organization and um, as noted in the certification form are to be in line with what a similarly qualified and situated attorney would be paid in that host city. So they are competitive salaries. Um, the host organization is required to provide fellows healthcare coverage and other fringe benefits. And then um, fellows have access to the EJW loan repayment assistance program for qualifying student loans up to $5,000 annually. And every October, EJW offers an intensive like three-day leadership and substantive issue area skill building session at the leadership development training. Um, alumni, once you finish your fellowship, get to participate in the alumni network, which is 2,400 plus people strong. And then um, as noted before, the host organizations receive support for the fellow salary, which allows them salary only, not benefits, but salary. The benefits have to be at the, the cost of the host org, but um, for the fellow salary. So depending on what they pay their employees, um, that's how the fellow salary is set. But Equal Justice Works for the class of 2024 is providing up to $62,000 annually um, towards that salary. So say the fellow is going to make, let's just pick an easy number, 75. That's a $13,000 difference that comes from the host organization. But um, 62,000 of that would come from EJW. So it allows the host organization to bring on that fellow. A little bit about designing the project. This is a little bit of a snap, oops, snapshot of the issue areas of the class of 2023 fellows. So these are the 76 fellows who will be starting their projects next month in September. Um, and we can see that education was a very popular issue area and working with immigrant populations was also very popular as a primary issue area, followed by criminal legal system or criminal justice reform, um, racial justice, children and youth and voting rights, electoral participation. Um, but as you can see there are, um, as I can, can read out, there's, um, you know, a couple dozen options for primary issue area. And there's a lot where just one or two fellows are working on that. Um, in the application, you'll be asked to select a primary issue area, but you'll also get to select a secondary issue area. So that shows us a little snapshot of um, the primary and secondary themes of the project. And the point is to kind of say that it's all over the place and there's no um, preferred <laughs> primary or secondary issue area. Um, again, this kind of comes down to to sponsor preferences and the number of applications that we receive in a certain area, which is uh, impossible to predict. So um, putting forward your strongest possible application is uh, a good strategy. And then in the class of 2023, just to say fellows do work all across the US and, and territories uh, in 2023 class. They're working in 24 states plus Washington DC at 75 host organizations and there are 76 fellows total. So as the math shows, there are two fellows at the same host organization. Host organizations may host multiple fellows in the same class. However, please note that as an applicant, you can only apply with one host org. That's because the project is so tailored to um, like your fit and your project's focus with that organization's work. 
Um, and so a host organization may have different departments or work in different parts of a state, for example, and um, have a need for innovative work being done by fellows who have different different skill sets, different language skills, different backgrounds, different, you know, familiarity with a certain um, legal issue, but applicants are really to be like aligning their personal skill set and professional academic background with one host organization. When you submit your application, it will be, um, it will be like linked the person's name, their applicant ID, and then the basically the host organization. So, um, and a project description, which we will get to later. So we're essentially looking at kind of like the issue areas of the project with the host organization and what this person brings to them. Um, and, and you as the candidate are the person who is responsible for clicking submit on the application, even though you are collaborating with the host org. So uh, a tip is to check out the fellow archive on the website. Um, Nico um, will kindly drop a link to that. And this you can filter by like issue, by host organization, by service location. And you can see what kinds of work fellows have done. This is a good way to kind of figure out maybe what made that project sustainable or what made that project innovative. Um, what has been done recently in the city where you want to do your project? How can your your project build off that or stand out from that? Um, please note that we um, at Equal Justice Works do not um, put folks in contact with current or past fellows. So any outreach that you as an applicant would like to do to current or past fellows um, is kind of is kind of up to you. I would. Also note that if you don't see the host organization there that you're looking for, that is okay. Every year there are new host organizations hosting fellows and there are some returning host organizations. There's not a um, preference at all. So if you don't see your host organization there, as long as they're eligible, no worries. How to write a strong application. So the application is composed of three larger sections, the project description, the candidate background, and the host organization background, which are, are broken out into um, shorter sections. If you uh, haven't yet created a login on Submittable and gone in, um, there is a reference application available on our website. It's like a blank PDF of the application so you can check it out that might be useful to share with um, host organization staff for example you're working with as an applicant because they might not want to <laughs> create a, a log in and like go into the submittable platform but they might want to obviously see the questions and the prompts there's also on our website um, and Nico can kindly drop this link in the chat a sample application it is from a previous class, it's, you know, can't be from the class of 2024 because that has not closed yet. It closes September 12th, midnight Eastern. But, uh, and so a few questions and prompts are slightly different, but that application, which uh, was redacted um, and we have the, the, the approval of the person to share it, uh, was from someone who became a fellow. Um, and it shows like how these sections were completed in an application where the project was funded. So a successful um, competitive application. So an overview of how to write a competitive application, the host organization and the candidate should be collaborating on the project design. Um, we recommend you think of it more as a business plan, less as a standard job application or grant proposal. Again, we recommend you focus on the fit, the candidate's unique ability to bring the right project at the right time with the right organization. So kind of the alignment between 
the portfolio of work and the mission and vision of the host org with the skill set and lived experience of the candidate. And then keeping in mind that timeliness component. And is this project happening? What does it look like to be working on this issue with this population addressing this need in 2024, 2025, 2026? Um, we recommend that you blend data, statistics, um, personal stories, and narratives of folks from that um, population or from like, you know, if it's your hometown, from your hometown to highlight your project's anticipated impacts on the, on the community in which you'll be working. And we definitely recommend that you check out the application resources that Nico's dropping in the chat. One is the application tips blog. And all the and that one's nice because there's a lot of things linked to in the blog and it's really kind of focused on the writing of the application. Um, all of the resources are housed on, on the main Design Your Own Fellowship application landing page. So if you're watching this recording later and you don't have access to the chat, that's where you'll find them. All right, so tips for the project description section. It should be very specific. It should be a one sentence description and should start with a verb. As I noted before, it's the tagline that accompanies your project throughout the uh, selection interview process. Here is an example of a project description that was funded. It is. Advocate for creative solutions to increase protections for individuals forced to migrate due to climate change through direct representation, trauma-informed pro bono training, and policy work. My only little caveat here is you may want to end it with in state or city. So in the area you're in or you're going to be working in. On the statement of need section, I do recommend that you check out the sample application on the website. <laughs> the statement of need is um, has a high, higher word count. I think it's 200, 200 words. So um, I'm not going to read that aloud, <laughs> but um, the sample application has a great one. So you're talking here about why this project is needed. Please keep in mind that the folks reading this um, application are not familiar with the host organization, necessarily are not familiar with the geographical and issue area together in great detail, um, and they don't know you. <laughs> so to talk a little bit about who reads your application, um, the first round of review is done by an alumni reviewer, so someone who's completed a DYO fellowship, uh, who has issue area expertise. Multiple alumni reviewers review each application. What they're really looking at is the extent to which the uh, answers in the application correspond to and address the prompt. So sticking tightly to the question that was asked, and any guidelines that were given, for example, in the project description, the start with a verb, the specificity, the one sentence, that is what they're kind of assessing your application against, the, the extent to which um, your application responded to that question, that prompt. Um, they're also looking at like for example in the statement of need it, it's about outlining the need was the need clearly outlined and like stressed that this is really needed that's where the compelling part comes in um this isn't a writing competition but concision and clarity are important uh so that the folks reading your application can understand it so after the alumni reviewer round, the 
members of the Equal Justice Works fellowships team do read applications as they're preparing for interviews with sponsors. So if a sponsor is looking to fund climate change related projects in Miami, they're going to look at who is proposed to work in the greater Miami area and who's working on environmental justice, climate change, um, working with vulnerable populations, et cetera, et cetera. So they're going to look for applications that fit the criteria of the sponsor. If the sponsor is looking for applications across Florida, they will look for, in any issue area, they will look for applications that scored well across Florida, and they will probably read all the applications that came into work in Florida. So um, then the applications are that fit the sponsor's preferences, if any, um, are presented to the sponsor's review team. And the sponsor determines which uh, folks they would like to, which projects they would like to learn more about. And the people whose projects those are, those applicants are invited for an interview. So again, the sponsor could be a private corporation or business. It could be a law firm. It could be an individual foundation, a bar association. Um, there's not really a way to predict who will be reading your project. So making it as understandable as possible is useful. Um, so back to the statement of need. <laughs> the statement of need should, and actually this does apply to other sections. Um, the, the section should have narratives that use data and statistics to support your point. Um, it should be clear that the applicant knows the law um, feel free to include a relevant case or statute, but citations are not necessary. There's just not space. And, and reviewers know this. Um, if you do use them, you can just put the last name uh, and a comma, Lily 2019, for example. And here we have a little bullet point on the order of application review. But again, I definitely recommend checking out the sample application for the statement of need. Um, another thing to look at in that sample application is the section on project goals and timeline. So some tips for that section. The goals and timeline section is like the how we're going to get this done, what we're going to do, and how we're going to get this done section of the application. Um, you should really start by um, a clear statement of what is, what is the project's primary goal or what are the project's primary goals. Um, categorize these goals. Is it an advocacy goal? This is very well outlined in the sample application. Is it direct representation? Is this under the umbrella of litigation work that you'll do, of public outreach, or education, et cetera? Then bullet point out what the goals are. Create a certain number of uh, you know, create two databases, one in English, one in Spanish for use by attorneys uh, working with this population in, you know, Washington, D.C. Um, train a pool of trainers in culturally competent uh, lawyering to work with West African immigrants in Northern Virginia, for example. Um, print and disseminate 50 pamphlets in English and Arabic to um, Syrian refugees in the greater Dearborn, Michigan area, et cetera, et cetera. So you can include number targets in there. You can have more overarching goals, um, outcomes. You can mention outputs like the number of pamphlets as well as outcomes like raising public awareness of X by disseminating 50 pamphlets. Um, again, be specific, uh, but also realistic. Um, what does your host organization currently do will help you determine what is realistic, um, what is impactful, what does this community need? If people are not reading pamphlets, do they need an app? Is a, a WhatsApp campaign more useful to raise public awareness, et cetera? What is feasible? Um, again, your host organization can help you determine if they have social media experts on staff who can help you do an Instagram campaign or something of the sort, do they have people who go out and do um, mobile legal clinics 
et cetera. Um, if not, and you want to set that up, how is it going to be mobile? Is that feasible? Do you have a car? Does the host organization have transit? Uh, do they have connections, transport? Do they have connections in the community where they can host your project, like the physical meeting space, et cetera, et cetera? Zoom, who has the Zoom licenses? So just talking it through with the host organization can really help you hone in on like these goals that you want to do. Um, maybe they've already done a lot of Know Your Rights awareness raising training, and it's on to the next step of collecting um, community concerns to advocate for legislative change. And again, this will be taking place a year starting a year after you submitted your application. So what will things look like in 2024, 2025, 2026? As shown in the sample application, it's great to use bullet points for your timeline and to break out the timeline per the prompt into six month increments. So months zero through six, months seven through 12, et cetera, and really get specific with the milestones or achievements you plan to do throughout those two years. The personal statement, again, it would be too long to read it out here, but I would um, recommend taking a look at that sample application. It should be compelling. It should be tailored and personal to you. Um, you can weave in not just like your personal lived experience, but also professional or academic information that's relevant. Why you are the right fit to do this project at this host organization in this application cycle. You can pull in your own lived experience, things you've observed with your family or seeing family members go through something, um, things you've seen as issues in your community or neighborhood coursework you've done. Um, there's a, a great example in the sample application of a course and an article that um, the applicant read that resonated with her experience in the foster care system as a child. Um, and that led her into um, working uh, in and on that system and working with children and youth during the project. Uh, internships you've held, past work that you've held, you know, the neighborhood you grew up in, et cetera. Um, it's not so much a cover letter of like, here's why I'm qualified to have this job because you're co-creating this job, this project with your host organization. So it's like more so how you are able to contribute something that only you can contribute to working on this issue with this population, with this organization. Um, sponsors are often you know, quite interested if you make it to an interview about hearing about why you want to do this project. I think that's a pretty common first question. And why this project uh, and what, what do you kind of bring to this area of law and um, area of the country? So um, I would just say like, consider what you're comfortable sharing and what you would like to write about or talk about. There's no need to divulge something that um, may be traumatic or may be uh, uncomfortable for you to, to write about or speak about. And it's certainly perfectly acceptable to draw on um, things that you studied or things that you, uh, that resonated with you um, that aren't necessarily something that you yourself experienced firsthand. So there is a section that I think <laughs> can be a little tricky for applicants, understandably so, about sponsor involvement in the project because one does not know what the sponsor will look like or who the sponsor may be. Uh, and sponsor involvement in fellow projects really varies. Um, it can look like a sponsor's, say it's a, a corporation with a marketing department, they, they can help, and we've seen this in the past, help a sponsor with um, design for a social media campaign, as well as pamphleting uh, and printing. That can be a pro bono kind of in-kind contribution to a fellow project. We've also seen law firms and corporations with attorneys on staff have attorneys dedicate pro bono hours to a fellow's project. Uh, a lot of fellows do find that pretty exciting, pretty cool to plug in. Um, it can look like a fellow inviting sponsor representatives to the unveiling of a report that they helped put together or um, a video that they made. Um, so in, 
in the application, it asks for a menu of options, and this does make the application more attractive to a range of sponsors. Could you offer a clinic? Can lawyers assist with drafting uh, documents or legislation? Uh, what about reviewing contracts? Are, could you use assistance with media opportunities, PR, or marketing, external relations, et cetera? Um, remote involvement, if possible, is a pretty cool thing to work in. And the host organization may have a pro bono program. This is asked about in the application as well. And we'll know what they've done in the past and we'll know what's realistic to offer. And then I would like to read from a successful application, an example of a strong pro bono uh, sorry, sponsor involvement section. I'm going to paraphrase. <laughs> So the applicant uh, who became a fellow did write in this section, this project is especially conducive to the participation of pro bono uh, attorneys and, and offers multiple opportunities for collaboration. Pro bono attorneys can play roles as co-counsel in the representation of an asylum seeker or representing the host org at name of host organization as amicus counsel at the appellate level. We can tap into our host organization's resources to provide necessary support to pro bono attorneys, whether they are in person or remote. Um, pro bono attorneys could also contribute uh, and collaborate uh, on developing training materials, assist with research and, and assist with research and drafting required for other written resources. Um, the fellow, the applicant, now fellow, notes that they can organize trainings for pro bono attorneys from the sponsor on such opportunities uh, on the asylum process as their project focused on asylum seekers and immigration and on working with expert witnesses. Um, they also note that they would like to do media promotion for their project and um, they would be open to uh, working with a sponsor to develop traditional and social media materials. Quite a range of options. Okay, a few tips that are tidbits. Make sure everything that is relevant is included in your resume. It could be your volunteer work, your internship experience, jobs you've held, coursework. Uh, we recommend that you schedule meetings with your host organization and or your review team. We'll get to that in a minute as soon as possible, given that the application does close before September 12th, uh, on September 12th at midnight rather, but we highly recommend you submit it in advance. Um, we just, we recommend that applicants do discuss uh, workplace culture, salary benefits, hours, supervision, professional development, et cetera, with their host organization, which is their employer. And um, we recommend the applicants make it pretty clear what are the to-dos left to complete the application at this stage. Um, there'll probably need to be some calendar invites <laughs> with deadlines for host organization staff, uh, maybe for the letter, letter writers, the letter of recommendation writers, um, so that you can get all that uh, done in time and not be worried at the last second, then something won't, won't come through. Um, there will need to be two letters of recommendation and a reviewer. Details on that are in the application. I'm sorry, not a reviewer, a reference, <laughs> a reference person. Um, so a few application mishaps we see that it is a little bit sparse and that explanatory information is lacking. Sometimes that pro bono opportunity section, like the one I just read out is really sparse. Um, again, really ask your host organization what might be feasible to put here and try to think creatively. Um, personal statements. We understand there are many reasons why you're interested in working on your project, but think about that narrative. Think about that through line in the story you're telling. And is it understandable to an, an external reader? Another section of the application is on collaboration. So we ask about how um, this project kind of fits into the landscape of legal services organizations and legal service providers in that issue area slash geographical region. Um, so that will require some research. Who are the community partners that your host organization works with? Who else is doing similar work in this area? Um, are they doing it in person? Are they doing it remotely? 
um, that can also lead to a sustainability lens for your project. Is there a coalition that exists that your organization is not a part of? Is there um, a way to set up a framework to consult with community partners who are working to meet the needs of the community that your project is also focused on? Um, but that section does require kind of speaking with folks who work on your issue area in that city and figuring out who's doing what and like how they work or don't work with your host organization. Um, sometimes project, project design can be um, a bit of a pitfall if it's really um, kitchen sink style and it's pretty overambitious and unrealistic. Or if it's really, we're going to put all our eggs in this basket and do this um, one big stream of work. What's realistic does depend on like conversations with the host organization. And we recommend a happy medium between <laughs> kitchen sink and unidimensional. So the fellow archive is a great place to check out to see how fellows kind of worked on different levels or used a few different strategies to achieve a few different goals, but also like how they weren't tackling, you know, 15 different things in, in 24 months. Um, again, this project description sentence should be uh, specific and clear. Um, and then a mishap that can happen are typo spelling or grammatical errors. While it's not a writing contest, it can just make it hard to read and hard to follow. We'll get to questions very soon. So tips for completing the application, just stick to the questions and the prompts in the application. That's what um, you'll be kind of uh, assessed against. And then like, is this clear to an external reader? We recommend you build a review team. You can have a professor from your law school, maybe one or two people from the host org be on your review team and try to work with your law school career services um, if possible. Maybe ask a classmate even to look at your resume, to look at um, your personal statement, um, even if, and, and how your personal statement fits into the statement of need. How does this read as a whole application? When you print it out, it's about eight pages. Um, so it's not the longest application. I understand it's very detailed and it does take a lot of work um, and like, we're so appreciative for the work that everyone puts in on these applications. So having someone say what was clear to them or what could be made a little clearer can be really helpful. Um, again, check out that fellow archive. There's a frequently asked questions document on the application site that Nico um, will link to in the chat. Uh, there's applicant and host org guides that are uh, already linked to and on the same landing page for the app. Uh, the application tips, blog has a lot of good uh, tidbits in there. And then try to submit before September 12th. Maybe pretend the deadline is the 9th or the 8th. Um, ask for, you know, your recommendation letter. There's uh, a ways out. Um, maybe give a deadline that's well before the 12th for those. Um, ask the person who you want to be your reference soon. We're in the swing of summer vacation. When school starts back up, folks get really busy. So whatever you can get up their soonest is, is a wise choice. With questions, you can email us at fellowshipsequaljusticeworks.org and I will check out the Q&A. How long should a strong personal statement be? Um, I believe the word limit for all the open text boxes in the app for this year is 200 words. Um, It should be in the application, but it's also like linked into the resume, for example, like why you wanna work on the project and why this draws you in is, is for the personal statement for sure, but it's going to be considered in that landscape of also the statement of need that you presented and the resume that you um, presented. So about 200 words I'd say on that. 
can a host organization apply at the same time a fellow applies to work with the host org? So the host organization does not submit an application. The fellow, the candidate, the person who wants to become a fellow does. Um, it's like one application, but the keeper of the keys, like the holder of the application is the applicant, the person who wants to be a fellow. So they are responsible for shepherding through the application, getting all the information they need from the host organization to complete it, getting those letters of recommendation, either uploaded right up into the application or ensuring that they're sent to the fellowship's email. If the recommender prefers that the person not see it, they can email it to us as detailed in the application um, before the application closes and for clicking submit in time. So the host organization is not applying as its own, own entity. The fellow is applying, or the applicant is applying to be a fellow at that host organization working on this specific project. Now for cohort fellowships, not design your own, but this other kind of fellowship that EJW offers as well, host organizations do apply directly. It's a different process. This is not the side of the team I work on, so I don't want to say something that might be inaccurate. Um, I would say you could email us at fellowships equaljusticeworks.org and we can direct your question to someone who works on a cohort um, fellowship program to get you more information because for the design your own, it is just the individual applicant who applies. How, how place specific should your application be? Um, we ask where the fellow will be working. We ask where the host organization is located, city and state, city and state, and or territory. And we ask if the project will serve a different location because we wanted to be really clear, especially if it's a remote or hybrid project. So your host organization might be headquartered in New York City. You might be working remotely from, I don't know, <laughs> um, North Carolina. You might be serving a, a population in New York City. You might be serving a population in North Carolina. Uh, it's it's really, we ask a few different questions to get at where is this host organization and where is the population you're serving? And then like, are you there serving them in person? Are you serving them remotely? And there's a, a box ticking question where it's like, is this a remote, a hybrid or an in-person um, fellowship? So we don't really we're not really super interested in necessarily like someone's home address, but more so like the location of the population that's being served. Um, and it is city and state. Is there a way to use supporting graphics, charts, graphs, et cetera, in the application? I believe it's all text. Um, so there's like that very basic, um, toolbar of bullet points, I think like bold italics, uh, kind of that level. Um, but that is not required for the application this time. It's really just, just textual. Um, there is a way to upload your resume though. Um, but no, it, it, it can all be answered. Um, in a text format, um, yeah, that's a very interesting point though. Footnotes and notes. Oh, so for citations, it would just be parenthetical citations if you wanted to use them. Uh, I believe that was depicted on the slide. And it was when I said Lily 2019, that was a parenthetical citation. 
What would a timeline look like for a direct representation based project example work with X number of clients by the first year? Um, so it also depends if the fellow is barred or not. Um, some folks do apply having already been barred. A lot of fellows take the bar going into their fellowships. They take it in July, but they don't find they become they start their fellowship in September, but they don't know if they passed the bar yet. So thinking when is this, when will you be barred? Uh, you might know in November or December um, or January or something. So you <laughs> uh, could not be doing direct representation solo, probably, I do not think, um, prior to that. Um, so I don't think that's super common in the first six months. Um, it also depends so much on the project, like what, like who you're serving, where and why. Um there's no firm guidelines on that. It should just be logical and sensical and make sense with the project. Um, and this is also a place to highlight the supervisor's experience working with especially new attorneys. And for example, stepping in and leading on like direct representation and how the fellow might be playing a more backstopping role prior to being barred, or even if they are barred as someone who is new to direct representation. So your supervisor section can be bolstered for that. Uh, for the personal statement word limit, I believe they're all 200 words. If What if someone has a deep passion for an area, but does not have a history of or personal lived experience with this area of law, but does have a significant professional experience with it. How can they express their personal connection to the project topic? Maybe explaining what drew you to gain that professional experience. Why did you do those internships? Why did you volunteer where you did? Why? What drew you in? What interests you? What did you observe or see or realize? Um, I do think the sample application has a nice mix of personal and professional reasons woven in, but does mention academic research, like scholarship that they read uh, in their undergraduate or law school time that resonated with them because of their lived experience, but resonated with them and led them to pursue an area of law. Um, so perhaps there's something that resonated with you, even if it wasn't, um, directly aligned with your lived experience. So also if you're saying I have the language skills to do this project, I've lived in this neighborhood and I know this community, um, and that gives me cultural competency. Um, maybe, maybe you didn't live in the community, but you were work in the community. So I, I think it can be a bit um, nuanced. It can be nuanced. Um, and like kind of getting to the origin story and getting to what drew you in. What, what is EJW's view on co contribution to the fellowship project by other non-host organizations? An organization that is not my host is willing to provide assistance and supervision on my project. So how should that be indicated my application? A fellow can only be employed by one host organization. That host organization is the employer of the fellow, like the keeper of the projects, providing the support on the project, verifying that they have the bandwidth and resources to support this fellow. We want fellows to be well supported and to be embedded in an organization and not to be <laughs> to be flying too solo. Um, it should be a mutually beneficial and mutually reinforcing experience between the fellow and the host organization. A lot of host organizations have um, fantastic, robust networks. And so it is pretty common for fellows to benefit from maybe trainings offered by other organizations to uh, go to network meetings go to partner meetings, go to coalition meetings, um, to when they're disseminating information to work with other members of the host organizations like coalition. Um, there's the community collaboration portion that talks about the land, that asks about the landscape of 
organizations doing work in this area. So I think that would be a good place saying, I plan to work with A, B, C organization. They, I plan to have them assist me in this way and in that way. I plan to work with these organizations to achieve that goal. That, that kind of specificity is welcome. Understandably, that's not always able to be known at this stage. Um, but I would say that collaboration section is a good place to indicate that. Um, supervision, I would say, should come from um, the host organization. Uh, um, so there can certainly be like advisory or like working in, in concert and having like meetings with others. But um, the supervisor asked about in the application is from your host organization. I suppose you could also detail there. Um, another key advisor on my project might be so-and-so from such and such organization. Do you have advice for what kinds of recommenders are most helpful? Is a pre-law school professional recommendation helpful or should we focus on legal internship supervisors? So under the letters of recommendation, section in the application, it says they may come from people you know from your legal, volunteer, job, or academic experience and should come from people who can speak to your work product. If you have previously worked at your host organization, it is acceptable for one letter to come from a person at the host organization. The letter writers should be different than the professional reference. The there is no preference as to pre-law school versus law school or legal internship supervisors. I would say that kind of focus on the work product, like who can speak to like how you work and your like ability to accomplish goals. Fellows work at an organization, they have a supervisor. And and again, we want it to be mutually reinforcing, mutually beneficial for the fellow to be like embedded in the in the organization, but they're also doing something novel and innovative. So there's like a kind of self-starter component. There's a launching of a fellowship project component for fellows. So who can speak to your ability to execute this project successfully? Um, so maybe kind of tailoring it based on what you did and like the alignment of what you did at that job or volunteer role or in that class or in that clinic that like aligns with like, oh, this demonstrates that so-and-so can launch, manage, and like deliver this project with the help of their host organization um, versus uh, perhaps like the title of the person who's writing the letter. Yeah, I think someone did know there is no word limit for the personal statement. I think that unfortunately didn't make it into the body, but the rest are all 200 words. So I can um, add that in there in the like um, platform. Can a letter of recommendation or reference be from some of the host org or should applicants try to get a recommender that's not at the host org? I think I answered that by reading the section of the application about that. Um. Yes. So that's answered in the application. And I just read that. It should be three different people. Uh, one reference to writers. Should the recommenders only be supervisors? Can they also be professors? Are clinical professors better or can lecturers also be used? Um, there's no preference. I'd say this, like I said earlier, like speaking to your ability to do this kind of project. So it was the, the coursework or the clinical professor or the lecturer, like was it focused on the primary or secondary issue at area of this project? Um, did you work on these issue areas? Can they speak to like your ability to deliver this project and the skills that you are saying you have that you can bring to this? Can they speak to those? For community slash service provider partnership, what if you're targeting a community that has a high level of need, but that you haven't worked in before? Mm -hmm. So if you went to law school in one region and you're pursuing a project in another region, how do you convey your commitment to working with organizations that you do not have a relationship with? Um, I 
the strongest applications do come from folks that have either issue area or geographical, well, have both actually issue area and geographical knowledge. It is certainly possible to have a strong application if you have issue area expertise, but not the geographical knowledge. But I, I, I think drawing out like what you know about the community in which you want to work. Do you speak relevant languages? This, this question, I didn't read out loud, but did, it did note that there's like an immigration focus. Uh, so highlighting coursework you've done, volunteer internships you've done on immigration related work. Maybe it was with a different population, but you do speak a language that's useful. Um, Maybe it's also worth kind of working backwards. And and there's two things I was I'm thinking of. One is working backwards and really thinking about the origin and the roots of your passion and your reason for wanting to work with this population and the narrative like that you can tell, like how how that can be explained. Um, because if if one is passionate about working with this population but might not have the experience now there is some food for thought for perhaps considering a class of 2025 application which would close in September of 2024 so doing this next year uh, and seeing experience you can gain in that region with that population if um, perhaps you're putting together your application now and realizing there isn't um, a lot that you're drawing on or perhaps thinking, well, what can I, what, what have I done that I'm really well suited to support folks in? Like, what is a legal need where I have been interning or volunteering or where I have been working. Um, it might also be interesting food for thought or like a useful exercise to check out the fellow archive and see if you can find folks who went to a law school, for example, in your region and who are working, for example, in the region or on the issue area somewhere else in the country that you want to do like who else who else has done this path unfortunately ejw isn't in a position to um put folks in contact um so any outreach is kind of uh, uh up to you as an applicant um but maybe just even reading the fellow profile can kind of outline can kind of shed some light on the way that they did that um can you share the powerpoint we will share the um recording on YouTube, which will show this screen. Um, if you email fellowships at equaljusticeworks.org, we can email it back to you. The PowerPoint. Thank you. Can a recommender be someone from the broader law school community who knows your work in extracurricular student-led legal service projects? For example, a school's pro bono or public interest director. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, what I read earlier does hold. So only one, so letters of recommendation may come from people you know from your legal, volunteer job, or academic experience and should come from people who can speak to your work product. If you've previously worked at your host org, it's acceptable for one letter to come from the host org. Um, letter writers should be different than professional reference. So yes, but depending on like how you know them. And also with the two letters, like think who can really speak about you. Cause sometimes maybe if someone's like a director, <laughs> I know from my personal experience, like the director isn't always someone um, um, who is like super involved in the day-to-day -day of perhaps like 
an internship. So maybe it's like a staff attorney at that um, place where you volunteer, but they really know how you write, how you work with this population, how you serve clients, your, your um, uh, abilities uh, to deliver on the project. Um, yeah, I will revisit this like missing word limit for the personal statement in the application and update that soonest. Okay, I'm seeing feedback that 200 words feels short. So I will look at what we had in previous cycles and pull that forward. We did switch application platforms this year. So I'm sorry for that hiccup. I do think it's a much more user-friendly system. It's called Submittable. So I I do, um, I do think it is an, a global overall improvement. Similar to a uh, earlier, yes, someone is referencing last year's word limit. Okay, let me pull that forward into this year's application to give that clarity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, can my resume exceed one page? Um, I don't have that part of the application open right now, but I know it says in there what it is. It says like, in case it says the length in the application. Um, one page front and back is certainly fine, but like um, tightening to one page can be helpful. Um, if you're losing a lot of useful information by tightening your resume to one page, you know, two, two pages, one page, one double-sided is, um, is, is doable. Okay. We are six minutes over time. So I'm going to try to just last call for questions. Um, and happy to answer. And again, we're at fellowships, equal justice works.org. Um, someone asks, I do not have a personal connection to the community in the geographical area. My project aims to help outside of sharing an identity with them. Is that a problem? Um, I think that there's a lot that we see in personal statements from different fellows about, um, how their identity and their cultural competency and their lived experience or their like, uh, awareness of how, folks with their identity are under address by the legal system are or have a need that is unmet in their acknowledgement of why and how that affects people in their community, in their identity group. Um, that is something we see in a lot of applications, a lot of personal statements. It's, I think, a lot of the origin of why fellows want to go into public interest law. They want to serve folks who are facing challenges or issues that um, can be identity, like related to having a certain identity in society um, and the way that society impacts on, discriminates against, et cetera, harms, hurts that identity um, or under addresses the needs of that identity group or that community. Um, so I'd say that's like knowing there's like a level of knowing and knowledge that comes with, with, um, awareness around that, that I think is often a compelling part of a personal statement and also can kind of explain, um, like why perhaps, someone took the classes they took or why they went to law school in the first place or um, why they want to work at this host organization that works um, with this group. Um, the geographical area, I, I think that does also vary by project and by like the field of law on um, the extent to which that's different in different states. Um, that could be something for the review team, actually, like floating a, 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 a couple questions to your review team in advance, like I'm concerned about this, or I'm thinking that maybe my lack of tie to this geographical area might, um, might be a uh, worrisome or might be coming across a certain 
way? Like, what does your review team think? And also like, there is the element of collaborating with your host organization. So um, why is the host organization it, interested in having you as a fellow? Um, even if you're not from that geographical zone or haven't lived there, they see something in you and they see something in your skills that they feel confident that you can do this job. So um, unpacking that with them and like maybe pulling that out a little bit in the application um, could be helpful. Um, just, just food for thought here. Thank you. If multiple people from the host org will be reviewing our application, do we have to add them all in submittable at one time or can we add collabor collaborators later on as long as we do so before submitting the application? Oof, I don't want to give the wrong answer. I, I believe you can have collaborators one by one, like not all at once, but in the application, there's a overall like cover sheet, like a um guideline section. And for technical questions for submittable. And I think you may want to ask them. Also, there might be, it might be helpful to have folks see it earlier, just given that we're less than a month out. Um, sorry, I'm not super sure about like the order of adding collaborators in submittable. So I wouldn't want to steer you wrong. Again, I think you can stagger them, but I'm, I would maybe submit that as like a technical question to them, to submittable. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, are recent graduates with pending bar results eligible to apply? Does the fellowship require bar passage? Um, Recent get graduates, as long as they fit the other eligibility requirements with pending results, yes, are eligible to, to apply, there is the commitment that the fellow will take the bar at the first available sitting. Um, so by, so fellow fellows are selected by May. Again, please check out the how to apply and tips to succeed webinar recording on the EJW YouTube to get into this in more detail. Um, that kind of goes into more the core elements and foundations, foundational elements of the uh, fellowship, but the selection process includes in May. So um, I figure if you have pending bar results now, you'll know by, by May 2024. And then you would know if you were selected as a fellow by May 2024, if you apply in September of 2023. And then um, that will be publicly announced in May 2024. And then if uh, you will be sitting again for the bar, um, then you would commit to taking it in July. But um, if you're already barred, then um, you obviously don't need to, to retake it. Um, but fellows do commit to taking the bar. Um, and if fellows uh, need to retake the bar, there is a process for that and they retake it during their fellowship. How, who, whoop, how should we select who is a reference as opposed to a recommender? I feel like a law school career services person would give a great answer to this. I would say like for the, the, the reference should be professional. Or, or someone who can speak to like you doing professional work because this is to do like a, a, a job, a project. Um, um, and the reference is someone who would be called, if the person is selected to interview, the recommendation letters will be read right at the beginning. So the, um, recommendation letters would be, um, we would want to have someone who can really speak to, yeah, your ability to execute on this project. The reference would be someone um, kind of confirming that closer to the 
potential selection as a fellow. Um, so to get to an interview, the letters of recommendation like are part of that. Like that's something that's shared with everyone who reads the application as part of the application. So I would say those should be pretty robust and strong and specific. And then maybe the recommender is someone who uh, maybe certainly could speak favorably to your um, ability to conduct the project, but maybe not have like a super high level of nuance and like enough to write like a strong letter. Um, and then with the word limits, I think the only, so all the word limits are in the application that will be in there except for the personal statement. I'm sorry about that. Um, and we'll use the one we had last year. So that's the only thing that would change. And I think it would be a lot longer than the other word limits. Um, so only one would be added and it would be in favor of the applicant to be longer so that you have room to do your, your personal statement. So there wouldn't be changes to the other word limits. Um, and like the goal, I would say too, to keep in mind, like thinking of that business plan is to kind of pitch for an interview. Um, so outlining what you can, what you hope to do and why, and then it's showing strong letters of recommendation, showing detail in the resume to show you're qualified to do this. Um, honing in on the fit and alignment with the host org and the project. Um, and the um, the goals to get to the interview. So in the inner, uh, and like being concise and clear, I'd say is important. So um, yeah, so only, only the personal statement would be, would be clarified and it would be the same as last year, which I want to say was 3,500. Um, I have to check those characters or words because I don't have that open from last year. But thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, appreciate your time. And um, we will be doing another one of these webinars on September 7th, I believe. And that is on the events page of the EJW website. Please, please, please do check out the application references and resources. I think they are really, really quite detailed. So um, we're also available at fellowshipsequaljusticeworks.org. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you so much and take care.